Hello and welcome to The Arise interview. 60 minutes of big questions from the big stories from the news and beyond with fresh insight and critical analysis. I'm Charles Anyagolu. Coming up in the next hour, he's an outspoken critic of corruption and bad governance, a perennial thorn in the side of both state and federal governments. But after months of rowing and rivalry with the governor of Kano State, the man who has just been dethroned from his exalted position as one of the most influential traditional rulers in Nigeria has said he accepts his removal from office. Mohamedou Sanusi II had been the emir of Kano since 2014, but on Monday, Governor Ganduje removed him for insubordination and replaced him within hours. So what happens next? Is it the end game of, for Mohamedou Sanusi? or could he emerge even stronger and more exalted? We have analysis in a moment. Now, until Monday morning, Mohamedou Sanusi II was the Emir of Kano. Six years ago, the former governor of Nigeria's central bank ascended the throne, becoming one of the most important traditional rulers in Nigeria. But his outspoken views on many issues of governance put him in dispute and at loggerheads with the state governor, who on Monday morning announced that he was being removed for insubordination. Last year, Mohamedou Sanusi Sanusi's emirate was divided into several parts to reduce his power. But now he's been ousted altogether and evicted from the palace. Just a few hours later, his replacement was announced, Aminu Ado Bayero, whose father was the emir before Mohamedou Sanusi II took the throne. During his last job as central bank governor, Mr. Sanusi caused a political storm by exposing massive corruption. Well, in a moment, we'll try to understand how Mr. Sanusi got into hot water again. But first, here is the secretary to the Kano state government announcing Amir Sanusi's removal, followed by some reaction from the public. Kano State Executive Council, under the chairmanship of His Excellency, the Governor of Kano State, Dr. Abdullah Umar Benduje, OFR, has unanimously approved the immediate removal, dethronement of the Emir of Kano Emirate, Mohammed Sunusi II. The Emir of Kano is in total disrespect, lawful instructions from the office of the state governor and the other lawful authorities, including his persistent refusal to attend official meetings and the programs organized by the government without any lawful justification, which amounts to total insubordination. No governor or president has right to banish a Nigerian citizen or forcefully move him to any location in violation of right of movement, right to life, and a multitude of other rights, except by an order of court. Who gave Omar Ganduja the right for what he did? As opposition, we do not double into traditional issues. But when government actions tend to assault our laws and intimidate citizens for speaking out, we must at all times try to say no. A man who was caught on video stuffing dollars in his pocket like this, in his barbariga, supported by the Buhari APC to manipulate his way to power, despite public rejection, shamelessly sat as a moral judge, both as accuser and judge, and passed sentence of detriment and banishment on the people's emir, who despite not being a perfect man, but is a shining light and hope for the future. Reaction there to the removal of uh, Mohamedou Sanusi. 
Well, for more on this, I'm joined now in the studio by the public policy analyst and grassroots politician from Sokoto State, Dr. Abubakar Alkali, and by the executive director of the Civil Society Legislative Advocacy Center, or CISLAC, Awal Musa Rafsanjani, who is from Kano State. Thank you very much indeed, gentlemen, for being with us. And I'll start with you, Awal, because you're from Kano State, and uh, it would be interesting to know, to get your take on this, how did it come to this point? Why was Sanusi so unpopular with the Kano State Governor? Thank you very much for inviting me to share my perspective on this issue. Um, we have been following the trend of events, you know, uh, since when this crisis broke, you know, shortly before the election, and uh, you know, the Sanusi Lamido, as you know, you know him. He's someone who will always want to speak the truth, and uh, he didn't. He did not regard, you know, his um, emirship as a barrier to speaking out, you know, his mind, you know, especially when, you know, uh, some of those issues are of great concern to him. And what are these issues? He was very much concerned, or he's very concerned about the state of poverty in the northern Nigeria. He was very much concerned about the out of school children. He was very much concerned about the dilapidation of infrastructure in the northern Nigeria. And he felt those issues, you know, uh, think that we should, you know, um, look at it. Uh, he was also very much, you know, uh, worried about the increase in criminality, kidnapping, and all social buses, which he said it is as a result of the entrenched poverty and lack of education that you know um, some people are doing that. And then he was also very much concerned about the rate at which people were just giving birth, you know, without means to support, you know, uh, the children that they are giving. And uh, he was very much, you know, advocate of women empowerment. Mm. So this obviously abused that some people who did not want to progress in the northern Nigeria or even, you know, to allow people to be, um, to have their, you know, rights, you know, they would definitely, you know, see this as an offense. So therefore, you know, uh, he did not only taught Ganduje, but he also taught those conservatives mm. who did not want to see people educated to know their right, who did not want to see also women being empowered, who also did not want to justice and frankness to happen. So you see, it doesn't matter your relationship with him. If something, you know, he believed in it, he will say his mind, mm. whether the president, whether the, uh, the governor. So these are some of the reasons that gave birth to right. the um, problems that, you know, he had. So uh, some of the concern that he has on the policy of the Kano State government, for example, borrowing money to go and, you know, um, do a rail, which there was no cost benefit analysis and he know he was a banker and uh, he understand the implication of that so he said that going to china to carry the entire executive and legislators to go and spend billions per one month in china to go and negotiate without proper negotiation it is not going to you know add value to the economy of the canoe that yes yeah, so I, I, I remember actually reading somewhere where he said that the number of schools yes. that you could build exactly. with that amount of money exactly. would transform yeah. the, the place so, so that was part of the crime he committed right and then of course other crimes you know he committed according to them is that you know uh, you don't expect emir you know, say to be like um, a local you know uh, councillor who every minute every time you want to do a meeting you want to him to come you know, and become like a uh, entourage, mm -hmm. you know. That emirship has dignity, has respect, you know, thousands of years. Mm -hmm. That was not how it was. And Sunusi was trying to redefine and remodernize, you know, the institution of that right. emirship. Right, okay, I understand that. Let me, let me bring Dr. Al Kali in, because never, in spite of the, the mm -hmm. very good points that Rafsanjani has made, the fact remains that that is a position that is appointed by the state governor, although it wasn't this state governor that appointed him, but it's a position that's appointed and dismissed by the state governor. And therefore, there's a certain amount of, if you like, respect that some would say you need to accord to the fact that this is the person who essentially, or this is the office that gave you your job. Yeah, that's right, Charles. Um, essentially, you have to, um, look at this issue from the legal perspective, which I presume that's where you are going. Um, what does the law say? 
is it the, um, the uh, does the state government has the right under the laws, under both the state laws and the federal laws, to appoint and depose? And as you rightly stated, the state government appointed him based on the laws. Um, fortunately or unfortunately, uh, matters of traditional institutions are now domiciled under state laws. Mm. So in that light, it was right for the state government to have done that. Now, the process of doing that is another issue. If, you know, the emir who was deposed thinks due process was not followed, and if he feels that um, he was not accorded the right, um, you know, uh, the, the right uh, procedure, the right proce uh, procedure was not followed, the um, established laws were not followed, he can actually uh, go to court, which I very much doubt now because if you look at his uh, acceptance speech, mm. uh, his moralist acceptance speech, he has accepted, he has actually even enjoined his uh, supporters to uh, recognize the next emir and accord him all, uh, all uh, Because I was going to mention that because there was a rumor floating around that some people, even if not himself, were planning to go to court on his behalf, including some of the civil society organizations. And we have, obviously, um, uh, Awa Musa Rafsanjani here. I mean, I, I don't know what moves they're making, but, I mean, that is something that is within yeah, the realm yeah, yeah, actually, of Actually, um, there are yeah. posts flying around that the uh, deposition or the detriment, if you will, is unconstitutional and unacceptable. Mm -hmm. The one that I read actually said, based on Section 38 of the Constitution, that anybody who is accused of anything should be accorded, you know, the right of fair hearing, which were, which the, the uh, this side feels was not done. Yes. But in other I words, in arbitration, he would have the right to come before you know, a panel or whatever, but then he may not have turned up at the panel given his sort of antecedents. Yeah, uh, yeah, actually, um, that was the last straw um, when the, the uh, state, you know, anti-corruption commission mm. invited him. And he actually went to court, uh, if I recall. And stopped clearly, the process. Yes, and stopped the process. Yes. Uh, but uh, talking about due process, the state government can actually argue that they have given him due process. Mm. Because if you look at the contents of their uh, briefing, uh, the reasons why he was deposed, they said in subordination, and when he was uh, invited, he's right. supposed to attend. So there was, there was, they had enough evidence, basically. They have, okay. of course. They wouldn't I, have I'm going to just ask you to hold on. We're going to come back in a second. We need to take a break. You're watching the Arise interview. Plenty more still ahead as we continue our chat about the dethronement of Mohamedou Sanusi as Emir of Kano. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Arise interview. I'm Charles Anyagolu. Now, he was the second most senior Islamic ruler in Nigeria, but that didn't appear to count for much. All the prestige associated with Muhammad Sanusi and the office he occupied for six years signed away, gone with a simple stroke of a pen and replaced within hours. Muhammad Sanusi was named Emir of Kano in 2014 after having been pushed out from his previous role as governor of the Nigerian Central Bank. Well, on Monday, he was officially dethroned as Emir, accused of disrespecting Kano state governor Abdullahi Ganduje. Mr. Sanusi had been at loggerheads with Mr. Ganduje for several months. Mr. Sanusi is a well-known, outspoken critic of corruption, and bad governance and has called for the modernization of the North, which he says is riven with poverty, illiteracy and corrupt governors. Here he is speaking recently. If you're a governor in the North or a leader in the North, and if you are seen as normal in the sense that you continue to do what your predecessors have been doing, doing the same thing which has been normalized, then there's something wrong with you, you are part of the problem. The real change in the North will come from the mavericks, those who are considered mad people, because you look around and you have to say, if this is the way we have been doing things, and this is where we have ended up, maybe we need to do things differently. 
if we have populated the government with middle-aged men, maybe we need to try younger people. Maybe we need to try women. If we have spent our time and our money on physical infrastructure, maybe we need to invest more in the education of our children. Maybe we need to invest more in nutrition. Maybe we need to invest more in primary health care. And the truth is, if you look at what NASA is doing in Kaduna with 40% of its budget in education, that is the only thing that is going to save the North. And I know that when we say these things, they don't go down well. We've been saying this for 20, 30 years. If the North does not change, the North will destroy itself. The country is moving on. Quota system that everybody talks about must have a sunset clause. The reason people like Nasser stand up and they're nationalists is that you don't have any sense of inadequacy. You don't need to ride on being from Kaduna State or being from the North or being a Muslim to get a job. You go with your credentials, you go with your competence, you can compete with any Nigerian from anywhere. We need to get our northern youth to a point where they don't need to rely on being from a part of the country to get a job. And believe me, if we don't listen, there will be a day when there will be a constitutional amendment that addresses this issue of quota system and federal character. The rest of the country cannot be investing, educating its children, producing graduates, and then they watch us, they can't get jobs because they come from the wrong state, when we have not invested in the education of our own children. Very outspoken, Mohamedou Sanusi there. And with me in the studio, the public policy analyst and grassroots politician from Sokoto State, Dr. Abu Bakr Al-Khali, and the executive director of the Civil Society Legislative Advocacy Center, or CISLAC, Awal Musa Rafsanjani, who is from Kano State. Thank you very much indeed for staying with us. And just listening to what he's saying there, Rafsanjani, I mean, that will have great resonance across Nigeria, not just in the north. Yeah, I mean, he has uh, spoken, and um, you know, those who want to know the truth, you know, they know that is the truth. Uh, you know, we cannot continue to populate our, you know, country and our north with illiteracy and uh, poverty, and allowing corrupt people to, you know, uh, create artificial poverty for the people. So he has been consistent and he has been you know, uh, talking about the fact that we need to educate people. And the only solution in his own opinion to deal with even the insecurity is when you educate people, you give them you know, work you know, uh, so that they can contribute in the society. Now, what worries us about this whole um, saga is the way and manner in which dialogue collapsed. Because the former president of Nigeria, Abdul Salam Abu Bakr, even today in his interview with Boss of America, he had you know, uh, mentioned that you know, the committee, they met with the governor, they met with the emir, they tried all that they could, including Angwati and all prominent people in Nigeria to plead with the governor and also, of course, the emir. And they came with the report, they submitted it to the Mr. President. And Mr. President, when the governor came to visit him with some political leaders from Kano, he told the governor that he has the right to do whatever he would do because the constitution allows him. So that was the beginning on the actually, you know, um, strength that the governor had. Mm. That since the president, you know, will not object any detriment or anything, you know, he would perpetuate his. Of course, the, the president himself has also been the object of criticism from. Y yeah, yeah, um, because people see him as a leader who is supposed to have even intervened right from the beginning, even from the crisis between Ganduje and Konkoso, because they were all in the same party. 
the president, as usual, he didn't, you know, do anything. On this one, you know, what, after people were talking to him, he set up a presidential committee, and even Governor's Forum, Dr. Kaya Defy, who is the chairman of Governor's Forum, intervened. Many leaders in the north, you know, they intervened, you know, pleading with the governor, since even the emir himself, he had, you know, um, uh, agreed that, you know, he would stop what Ganduji consider as disrespect. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, um, the politics is that, you know, Ganduji felt that it was Konkoso who appointed, you know, or who confirmed the appointment of the Emir Sunusi. So therefore, anything that has to do with the Konkoso, he has to demolish it. So that is the real political angle mm -hmm. to it. The other aspect has to do also with the insinuation that uh, leaving Sunusi 2023, it's a bigger picture that they must make sure that, you know, they silence anybody who might constitute a problem to them. But the only thing that we were not happy with, with you know, is the way a manner in what his fundamental human right was actually abused yesterday. Um, by his, seen, the the process seen, of yeah, his removal. We, we have seen we have seen the security, you know, uh, personnel, police, DSS going into the palace, and in fact, his private, you know, um, rooms, you know, uh, which is really gross violation of his privacy as a as a as a as a. So even if they dethrone him, the second problem that we have, you know, is that why must you? Banish him. Hmm. The Constitution of Nigeria clearly, you know, uh, Section 39 and 41 clearly gives every Nigerian the right to freedom of expression and movement. Now, when you banish somebody, he has no access to anybody, he has no access to his wife, he has no access to his family, to his friends, he has no access to even communication. This is contrary to the Constitution of right. Nigeria. But obviously, he can go to court. Yeah, I mean, so, but, but, but what, what, what we are saying is that why should you know, because Gan Ganduje doesn't control police, he doesn't control DSS, which means that some people in Abuja were part of that because for you to use police, army, and DSS like we have seen in television and video going into the palace, hmm. somebody must have given that approval because the governor does not control, you know, those, you know, um, instruments of uh, security, you know. So I think, you know, for me, the fundamental thing that we object strongly is this banishment, you know, because you cannot banish somebody, you know, especially when he has agreed and he had even called his family, his supporters, everybody to give loyalty to whoever is appointed. Mm -hmm. I think that is great humility. Well, I, I'm just wondering whether that banishment can actually be enforced. I mean, I, I because I'm, I, from what I understand, he's enforced? under virtual house arrest at yeah. the moment, which yeah. means that he can't actually do where, anything. Where to he's be honest, surrounded uh, by he cannot come honest, out. Chris, to be honest, Chris, um, this is actually a tradition. It is colonial tradition. Well, <laughs> uh, even in 1996, that was uh, what was done. Yeah, there's when, precedent. When there, there's precedent. Yeah, Thank you very much. Right. There was precedent. So uh, it is a, a normality in you know that part of the country. When an emir is deposed, he's not allowed to remain in his domain for reasons of uh, security, for reasons, of course, of uh, breakdown of law and order. Right. So it's been a tradition. But uh, as you rightly stated, this is not saying that, um, you know, his fundamental human rights should not be enforced uh, if uh, his own, you know, uh, group, his own supporters or himself feel that they should go to court to enforce his fundamental human rights. Maybe that will even help stop the trend mm. because there is no high It'll set a new precedent. president. There is no high profile emir who is deposed and left in the domain. Well, it's not actually just in the north. I, I think it happens in different parts of in Nigeria different part, part as of well. The country, so yeah. it's a kind of custom. That's right. Well, well uh, to be honest, um, behind all of that, I think uh, there are two issues I look at here. Um, one is that, to be honest, Rightly, you have to respect Emir Senusi because he is a very eloquent man. He likes saying his mind and all of that. However, now the fact remains that he actually brought a system, sort of method of traditional leadership, which is alien mm. to the community. Our people don't uh, are not used to. So he's a pioneer of sorts. I tell you, I tell you, our people Ahead are of simply his time. yes, are simply not used to an emir or a traditional ruler of that. Um, you know, um, a reformist, standing, activist, standing traditional to, ruler. To <laughs> standing to activist. yeah, yes, to actually criticize authorities. They are not used to it. Mm. It is alien. Now this is clearly um, uh, a conflict 
between the political authority and the traditional institution. And of course, the political authority always wins mm. because now the they have the muscle of state. Yes, yes. The the traditional institution actually has been the prestige, the profile of the institution um, has been so much lower that you think it's been eroded. I tell you, you you, you find local government chairman actually, you know, giving directives to uh, even first class AMS and all of that. So political authority always wins. And clearly, it's one in this case. It's one okay. in this case. I want to thank you, Awal Rafsanjani, because I know you're going to be traveling soon, so you need to get home and pack your bags. But thank you very much indeed for being with us, and do stay with us. We'll continue this chat in a moment. You're watching The Arise interview. Plenty more still ahead as we continue our chat about the dethronement of Mohamedou Sanusi as Emir of Kano. Stay with us. Welcome back to The Arise interview. I'm Charles Anyagolu. Now, a day after he was removed from office by the governor of his state, one of Nigeria's most influential Muslim and traditional leaders, the Emir of Kano, says he accepts his dethronement as the will of God. Mohamedou Sanusi II was dethroned on Monday for insubordination, according to the Kano state government. He was escorted out of the palace by armed police and replaced by his predecessor's son, Aminu Ado Bayero. In his first comments since he was deposed, Mr. Sanusi called for calm and for people to embrace the new emir. State government officials said Mr. Sanusi was removed in order to safeguard the sanctity, culture, tradition, religion, and prestige of the Kano Emirate, accusing him of total disrespect of institutions and the governor's office. But many say his sacking was politically motivated because of a protracted dispute with the governor of Kano State, Abdullahi Umar Ganduje. We'll continue our discussion about all this in a moment. But first, here's another clip of the characteristically outspoken Mohamedou Sanusi. Misdefining and misunderstanding our priorities. And we have to be very honest with ourselves. I'm an economist, and I always talk economics, and we look at the numbers, and we look at poverty. If you look at all the poverty indices in the world today, you find that in southwest Nigeria, the incidence of poverty is 20%. In the northwest, it is 80%. The northeast, it's 80%. Why is it that the poorest parts of this country are the Muslim parts? Why is it that in a state that started Sharia in 1999, and we just heard the opening verses today, Iqra bismi rabbika ladhi khalaq. This is the very first verse revealed in the Quran. How come? that the state that started Sharia is not the one that is the most educated state. In fact, how come that in that state in 2017, only 24 children got five credits in secondary school? How do we define Sharia? How do we define Islam? Illiteracy? Malnutrition? Children on the streets? We have to ask ourselves. And we can't ask those questions until we begin to understand through usul that you have to live in this world well in order to serve Allah for the hereafter. For Islam to prosper, we need educated Muslims. We need Muslims that are not begging. We need Muslims who are standing on their feet. Believe me, if poverty continues in the north, Islam will disappear from the north. The Prophet said, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-kufri wal faqri Allah, I seek refuge with you from disbelief and poverty. And he said, Kaad al-faqru an yakuna kufran. Poverty can lead to disbelief. 
These children that we see as almajiris and we laugh at them and we treat them as victims, somebody will just come and pick them up, put them in a school, give them medical care, and convert them to another religion. And they will do that by the hundreds and the thousands. So, what we see on the street is a product of bad economic policies and wrong priorities. These children are not criminals, they are victims. What part of Islamic law, what verse in the Quran, what hadith of the Prophet allows a father to give birth to a child and leave the child to go and fend for himself? Mohammed Sanusi, the deposed Emir of Kano there. And with me in the studio, the public policy analyst and grassroots politician from Sokoto State, Dr. Abu Bakr Al-Khali. And we're also joined now by the chairman of the editorial board of the People's Daily Newspaper and former media advisor to the governor of Bauchi State, Ali M. Ali. Thank you very much indeed for coming in. Thank you for having me. And I'll come me, yeah. straight to you, yeah. Ali. Um, yeah. What do you make of all this? What, um, you see, what I make of all this is that um, invariably, given the nature of Sunusi himself, people who know him, if you look at his trajectory since he came into the public consciousness, well, most noticeably when he was CBN and governor, you will say, yeah, this is expected. And that there is no way he was going to survive the onslaught. Uh, partly by his own making, and then partly by a combination of so many factors, politics largely. But you would say he had it coming all along. Mm. Uh, like we all know, uh, the man was, I hope, perhaps he will have an iconoclast. He's someone who ruffle feathers anywhere he goes, while he was CBN governor. <coughs> easily the most visible of the CBN governors. Mm. We have the central bank governors. So yes, you would expect that eventually something had to give in. There was no way he was going to survive. Uh, and then if you look at the makeshift peace made in the past, there was an attempt in the past to broker peace between, if you like, the warring uh, parties, mm. that is the government of the state on one hand, and Emir Sunusi. But then you see, Emir Sunusi, uh, Sunusi Lamido, if you like, was like a tragic hero. He had a flaw, a fatal flaw. Like all tragic heroes, they have one shortcoming. In his own instance, is uh, being iconoclastic. He is uncompromising, basically. Yeah, He's not you going could to say, cut could, corners in order to retain his position. Precisely, and that's why in the, f he wasn't really fit for a, uh, a throne like that, so restrictive like a traditional institution. Because clearly you could see that he's not a conformist. Yeah, but, uh, but of course the traditional institution and the point he's making consistently is that the traditional institution needs to be reformed. That if you occupy a position that commands so much respect and you don't do anything positive for your people from that position, what's the point of having it? Yeah, you see, there are so many ways you could, beyond talking. You see, what really, and he met quite a lot of people. So the problem was that he spoke publicly about things. Exactly, that's right. one. That he one. didn't go behind the scenes and Pre put pressure because on. Because the nature of the traditional right. institution is to, I mean, so how many times do you see the Queen of England mm. engaging prime ministers in public glare? There are so many channels of communication mm. going behind the scene. Only if and only then you could have resort to other uh, his predecessors. Yeah, you, you do have a point, actually. Yes. Let, yeah. let me bring you in, um, Dr. Al-Khali, because, I mean, the, as he correctly pointed out, if you look at the Queen of England, the one thing she doesn't do is speak publicly about politics. Exactly. Well, but that doesn't stop Prince... I mean, Prince Charles has spoken quite a lot about reform, yeah. And the, the mere fact that they engage in so many charitable activities suggests that they're pointing the government in a particular direction where there are deficiencies in society. Yeah, well, um, that's right. But um, in this case, to be honest, uh, there is a conflict just that, like I was saying. 
there is a conflict between the political authority and the traditional institution. Now, you see, Charles, you have to look at the mentality of the people for you to be able to be uh, understood clearly and properly. Yeah, but we're not um, talking about, I don't mean to interrupt you, we're not talking about the mentality of the people. Okay. We're talking about the mentality of the people who are ruling. That's right. <laughs> now, 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 there's a big difference. Now. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Now, what I was trying to say, it was an example actually I was going to. Um, like, you know, I'm from Sokoto, you said it, and mm. uh, in those days I grew up, you know, to, to see this. I grew you're up you're into the this. heart of the caliphate. Yes, yes, I grew up into this. Mm. The late Sultan of Sokoto, um, uh, Abu Kari III, whatever happens, whether, you know, for or against his views, when they come to him, he says, Mubarma Allah, everything is with God Almighty. Mm. This is like a symbol for him. Everybody knows him for this. The, um, the, form, the, the letter, Emir of Kano, the same thing. You see, um, you have to, the, what I'm talking about, uh, mentality of the people, you have to look at what is obtainable, what is on ground, yeah, but, what but is, uh, but, but, but then again, for the you point. to be understood, mm. right. for you to be understood, I'm not saying all that he was saying right. were wrong, but the issue is how do we get those things corrected? There's a process. And moreover, if you will allow me to say this, uh, Charles, moreover, I think it will have even done, uh, given a better value to the people he is fighting for. If he had been able to come indirectly into the reform process, what am I talking about? For example, the Almajiri uh, thing he mentioned. If um, Emir Senussi had come to see, without talking about it, had come to say, okay, I am spearheading the modeling of schools to accommodate al -Majiri. I'm in my own capacity building a skill acquisition center to train al -Majiri. You know? And that is a foundation. That is pe pe what people can look at to uh, understand better some of these things he is saying. But is, is there, let me bring you in, uh, mm. Ali. Yeah. I'm trying to gauge the mood of people in Kano State. Because I've been to see Senussi. Yeah. I, I filmed quite a lot of his stuff. We mm. ran some of the pictures here. Yeah. Um, he, he seemed to enjoy a lot of popular support, which is a little bit different from enjoying official support. Well, popular support, yeah, maybe because you see, you can't take one thing away from Senussi, which we all acknowledge. In fact, nationally acknowledge mm. his immense brain power that cannot be taken away from him. And then, secondly, he as the monarch of Kano until yesterday, was very flamboyant. So you, think, you think the government, the people there felt threatened by him? No, not only the government. He, he ruffled even among the traditional cycle, among right. the monarchs. Okay, I'll tell you what we're going to do. Yes. I don't mean to interrupt you, yeah. but we must take a break. We'll come yeah. straight back to you okay. so you finish what you're saying yeah. there. You're watching the Arise interview. Plenty more still ahead as we continue our chat about the dethronement of Mohamedou Sanusi as Emir of Kano. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Arise interview. I'm Charles Anyugul. Now, as you probably know by now, the former head of Nigeria Central Bank, Mohamedou Sanusi II, has been deposed as one of the country's top Islamic and traditional rulers. He's been replaced as the Emir of Kano after months of rowing with the governor of the state, Abdullahi Ganduje. After falling out with Governor Ganduje in 2017, Mr. Sanusi did not attend state functions and official meetings, which the government said amounted to total insubordination. The Emir's refusal to appear before a panel investigating allegations of corruption against him also did not go down well with the government. He's accused of selling property and mismanaging funds, but he secured a court order stopping the probe. Mr. Sanusi was seen as a reformist and had been critical of some government policies, a stance that frequently put him at loggerheads with ruling politicians. Let's take a brief listen to one of his recent public utterances. It's fine to say um, to a rural villager, you should send your daughter to school. 
but it's not fine to say to the governor, why haven't you built a school? You don't have food security. You've got millions of children out of school. It's not the fault of the children that they're out of school. Somebody was supposed to build those schools. Um, so uh, the difficulty for traditional institutions is, on the one hand, they're firefighters, and, and we'll continue to do that. On the other, um, to actually address the root causes of extremism, you've got to address questions of governance, education, um, health care, corruption. And to do that is now political. If you take the UNDP OHDI poverty index in 2015, um, poverty levels in Nigeria, 46%. And um, 46% doesn't look too bad compared to other countries. <coughs> However, if you break these numbers down, in the southwest of Nigeria, 80% are living above the poverty line. In the northwest, 80% are living below the poverty line. And suddenly it becomes two different countries. Okay, you, and now, and even those numbers don't tell you anything. As governor of Central Bank, I looked at numbers that said people are living on less than $2 a day. And it sounds bad. But you don't really know how bad it is until you look into the eyes of a woman whose baby has just died because she cannot afford drugs worth $5. When we go into crowd resources as states, so you have state governors in the north who have 3 million, 5 million children on the streets without school. They go to China and they're looking for money not to build schools, but to build a light rail. <laughs> you know, I mean, you spend $2 billion on a light rail. $2 billion. Imagine how many children you would educate with that. Mohamed Sanusi there. And with me in the studio, the public policy analyst and grassroots politician from Sokoto State, Dr. Abubakar Al-Khali. And we're also joined by the chairman of the editorial board of the People's Daily Newspaper and former media advisor to the governor of Bauchi State, Ali M. Ali. Thank you for staying with us. And back to you, Ali. You were making a point before we... Um, we went on a break. Yeah. Well, the point I was, going, I was making is that um, how popular was Sunusi among his subject? Mm. Now, you, you look at the subject itself, the, 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 those who revered him. Naturally, people revered, they respect the stool of the Emir mm. of Khan. Mm. Is what respected over the years. But then sometimes people ask, <laughs> what makes the priest? Is it the kasok? Is it the individual that makes the stool? Or the stool making the individual? Now, when Sunusi assumed uh, the throne five years ago, against all odds, because this is the first time Sunusi, a grandson of an emir, not a son. Mm. He wasn't really a direct, as such, contestant. If to the throne, but against all odds. Nobody so he came, in, he came to power through political maneuvering. Exactly. Right. He wasn't a front line, if mm. you like. <laughs> he wasn't among those favored to be mm. a successor because his father wasn't an emir. It was his grandfather mm. that was an emir. So that in itself w was a major upset. Mm. Up, uh, upset. It quite upset a lot of uh, permutation and expectation. And then when he came, he came with his own unique flamboyance, mm -hmm. a razzmatazz. Uh, he was the man, like we, saw, we said earlier, his immense brain power. And then he had connections all over the place. Globally and locally, his tenure as a governor of the Central Bank was quite remarkable. Mm. Uh, if you recall, at one fell swoop, he brought enormous changes in the farm banking uh, sector. But at the time he was CBN governor, he captured the imagination of a lot of people. But even before then, when he was chief executive of the nation's, uh, one of the oldest banks, the first bank, mm. he also caused quite a stare. But before then, as general manager of a commercial bank, general manager, United Bank for Africa, mm. I think, he had a running battle with the governor of Kano State, who eventually was to appoint him, uh, Rabi Musa Konkoso. When Rabi Musa Konkoso was the first tenure in 19, between 1999 to 2003, he had a running battle with uh, 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 Sunusi when he was in, uh, gen general manager in UBA. He wrote something very caustic. His pen, just like his tongue, mm. was very acerbic, very caustic, and he had problem with Konkoso at the time. Mm. But fast forward to 2014, when he, against all odds, became uh, a governor. In less than a year, Konkoso queried him twice. A lot of people, either they have forgotten that. 
if people say if Konkoso had remained governor, he probably would have kicked him out right. because uh, long before now. Okay. Yes. Well, let, let me move on from there because there is now a new emir. Um, tell us about Aminu Ado Bayero. I understand he was the son of a former emir of Kano. Yeah, he was the son of a former emir of Kano. Mm. Um, this is mm. like a trend. Um, I liken it to what happened in Sokoto when um, let a worker the third uh, left the stool, um, passed on, and um, the Sugi was appointed. Uh, you remember the crisis that you know engulfed the state at the time, because it seemed people were more on the side of the you know traditional institution, mm. the, uh, the the those that they are used to, kind of, because that is the house that has been there for quite a very long time right. from Muhammad Bello, um, the first sultan. So people were used to that, that institution, that house, that ruling house. And when somebody from the outside was appointed, um, they were Christ. That was the Sufi. Now, when the Sufi was deposed, someone from that ruling house, that's Muhammad Mochebu, was brought in. So this is uh, like the same trend we are seeing here. Um, obviously, I mean, Adubaro, um, uh, also um, a well-established, well-exposed person is from the Adobayoro um, you know, mm. um, side of the family tree. And Emir Senusi, you know, rightly or wrongly, is looked at as, you know, someone from the outside, you know, coming in and, you know, um, distorting all permutations and predictions. Uh, so now this uh, trap is going to be a steadying hand. I right? really think so. Right. I really think so because people are used to that line. Right. That, uh, that, that's, that's what I think. Okay. Well, 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 well we, we've got about a minute. Yeah. How do you think um, Sanusi is likely to come out of this? Is he likely to remain bullish and robust and might it strengthen his support in the north and across Nigeria? No, I, I think, well, see, what if... Sanusi is not likely to, first he will not be cowed. Now he's not been spared the burden of the Toban. Mm. So he's not going to be cowed. Uh, in prison or in banishment or in isolation, Sanusi I think will be stronger. Already he has national sympathy. If you see beyond uh, the government mm. of Kano State nationwide, maybe beyond the borders of Nigeria, he has a lot of sympathy. But I don't see him having any political post <laughs> uh, Some people are talking about him as possible president. But yeah, but I don't see him that becoming, making any headway because of his own nature. You know, when you are so uh, intellectually uh, persuasive or right. even uh, you ruffle a, quite a lot of feathers. So, so he's not, not he's not, he doesn't have enough of the capacity to make political compromises, which is necessary. Which is okay. absolutely necessary. I'm going to say thank you very much right. indeed to both of you, Ali M. Ali, and of mm. course, Dr. Abu Bakal Kali. Thank you very much indeed for coming in. That's it for this edition of the Arise interview. Join us again tomorrow. From me and the entire team here in Abuja, bye-bye, and thank you for watching.